Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for joining us for the 22nd edition of the World Sustainable Summit, India's premier platform for deliberating the discourse around sustainability and climate change. My name is Shireen Pandita, and I will be your MC for today's session. We have with us two very eminent panelists. I don't think anybody needs any introduction for them. For this session on driving ambition and action for a sustainable future, this session is being moderated by Ambassador Manjeev Singh Puri, Distinguished Fellow Terry. I would request Ambassador Puri to kindly take the session forward. The floor is all yours, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean the light. Oh, the light. Oh, they like your Terry. <laughs> oh, I see. Hello. I see. I think. Yeah, the problem. What do you want me to do? Hello. Yeah. Hello. Can you all hear me, please? Thank you. Uh, Madam, I have a request. Is it possible to switch off these two lights? <laughs> Whoever is in charge, is it possible for us to switch off these two lights? Just switch them off, please. We want to see the audience. If you notice, this is perhaps the only session without name cards. <laughs> and a simple reason for that is that everybody knows His Excellency Dr. Bharat Jagdeo the Honorable Vice President of Guyana, and a great friend of Terry. Yeah. Dr. Jagdeo, a hearty welcome to you. Thank you. And what should I say for my dear friend from Upper Manhattan, Professor Jeffrey Sachs. Many of us are here because of his writings, because of what he's done. So I think everyone knows it. But we'll keep this session sort of informal. I was told we've already lost 10 minutes, but I told them that, you know, lunch will have to be cut down. I think these are the most interesting people here. You know, the last time, exactly here on this very stage, around the same date in the year 2020, I had the privilege of talking to Professor Jeffrey Sachs, and I asked him whether the issue really wasn't about midterm Manhattan versus upper Manhattan. Sir, you won. We are referring to the Trump administration. For those of you who are familiar with United States politics, please understand that in various ways, it is not just the dominant economy of the world, still is, but is the dominant power in terms of ideas, technologies, and I dare say money and finance. No matter, Professor Sachs, what you told us in the morning, we are getting there, but not there. Today, it's you. Ladies and gentlemen, I will try and ask a few questions of my panelists, which are basically on the politics of things. You've heard a lot here about technicalities, about what's happening on greening, what's happening on the global gas house, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, on global warming, green budgeting. They're all technicalities, they're all flow. But we are talking about nation states. We are talking about countries and I'm afraid the answer to all of this lies in politics and it's intertwining with economics. And that's something that everybody, more so in a country like India, must be completely familiar with. Because the idea of nation states are something that we, even India, which is now 75 years as an independent country, is still to come to terms with. And we talk a lot about civilizational states. Those are very good and lovely ideas and about where we are and our one family concept. But we are in the real world of nation states and what they do. So let me start. And I want to recognize a few people here. I want to recognize former secretaries in the Ministry of Environment who are here. I, of course, want to recognize His Excellency, the Chairman, the President of COP28 designate. Sir, we are extremely honored that you are sitting here with us. Thank you very much for that. I don't know if others are there, a former vice chair of the IPCC is with us here. Former chief advisor to the UN Secretary General is also with us. Janos, thank you. Jean Pascal, welcome to you. I don't know if Mr. Vijay Sharma is here, another former secretary, but Dr. Ghosh is very much there. To all of you, I want to say a great welcome. And please, if there's something very urgent that you want to say, please do raise a hand. We'll try to make a little bit of space for that because I think your ideas and your questions are perhaps more important than what I have to ask them. But let's start. Professor Sachs, let me ask you a question. 
You've written a lot about multilateralism. When you spoke today, you kind of mentioned that perhaps hegemony is on its way out and we need to look at a more collaborative world. I don't disagree with you. In fact, I love and wish for that. Naturally, coming from India, that's a desire from the heart. But let's look at what has happened in the last one year. Oil companies have posted their highest profits ever. And I want to tell you, coal companies have seen the highest coal prices ever. Not many people here are perhaps aware of that. We've also seen, including European countries, push back on targets. So, sir, let me ask you this question, taking off from our last conversation, Upper Manhattan versus Midtown Manhattan. Are we thinking that I won't name the two protagonists who everybody knows about the conflict in Ukraine? Is it that they are doing exactly what the previous administration did for climate change, which is a four years hiatus. Well, it's, it's a big uh, question. I, I think we're in a 500-year cycle right now, uh, at the end of a 500-year cycle, as I was saying, which is the end of the, the North Atlantic dominance of the world. It's not going to be smooth, the change of geopolitics. The British really thought they ran the world for 150 years, from 1800 to 1950. When you listen to British politicians, they seem still to think they run the world. Uh, the United States leadership absolutely believes it runs the world. Uh, I know, I, I taught at Harvard for 21 years, 22 years. I teach at Columbia University. I know what's taught. It's a little weird. Uh, the United States is 4% of the world population. It's 15% of the world economy. Uh, and uh, it thinks it dominates. Uh, it's, it's crazy. But really, they think that they run the rules-based system of the world. We're in the end throes of that right now, but it's extremely dangerous. The reason we have a war in Ukraine is because the U.S. wanted to push its military alliance into the Black Sea region. Nothing more, nothing less. This has been clear collision course since 1992, but especially since 2008. When a Ukrainian president objected to this, said we want neutrality, the U.S. helped to overthrow them in 2014. That's when the war broke out, not last year, but nine years ago. So this is a, these are antiquated, anachronistic fights. Extremely dangerous because crazily our politics lives on this right now inside the United States. Uh, but they don't hear, the public doesn't hear almost anything to the contrary because the media don't report anything to the contrary. And the rest of the world is watching this spectacle. How bizarre it is, frankly, because the world really does not turn on Ukraine right now, and especially not on whether NATO is in Ukraine or not. That's the least interesting question of the whole planet right now. But it captivates the entire multilateral process right now. And my advice is do something else. Don't, let's not waste the time on this so directly. Substantively, positively, I'm for a world of strong regional cooperation in each region of the world. I was just at the African Union summit. The colonial powers, unlike in India, divided uh, Africa into 54 countries. This is ridiculous. That's a legacy of colonialism. So now they're building a union, finally. That will make a huge effect on the world because that's 1.4 billion people. They're going to be bigger than India. I have to tell you, yeah. in population size. You'll be the biggest population of a single country, but the African Union will be the single biggest region of the world very soon. That's good. If we had a unified African market and politics, this will change the world dramatically. If India, China, African Union, uh, South America under 
I hope Brazil and Argentina's leadership can get together, because the U.S. tried to divide Latin America. You're either Chavista or you're anti-Chavista. You're either with us or you're against us, which is the American way. That is what we're trying to overcome so that we can actually do important things like save Guyana's rainforest, save the Amazon rainforest, uh, build a continent-scale zero-carbon energy system. Uh, and all of these things are utterly achievable. But I do take issue with you. It's not going to come from the United States. It, the vision's a little old. It's here where you have the more dynamic vision. It's places that are growing. It's places that are saying, okay, we were held behind. Now we're really growing, but growing in a 21st century way, not fighting to hold on to a 20th century way. Professor Sachs, thank you very much. And you know, you've gladdened my heart even if you took issue with me. But you've provided a perfect segue for me to turn to Dr. Bharat Jagdeo. Dr. Jagdeo, <coughs> you're sitting here on Terry, in a sense on our soil. And you know, I can't help but recall R.K. Pachauri, the founder of Terry, who <coughs> used to say at every single one of these UNFCCC meetings when he saw you, here is the one man who knows what is the problem. And perhaps has an idea of the solution and the ways forward. We're very happy. But Professor Sachs just mentioned something, and you also spoke about that in your opening address, <coughs> the question of forests. Let me ask you a question. All of this is particularly important, but you have a very practical situation that Guyana today faces, which is the discovery of oil, and perhaps a change in the <coughs> economics of the situation that Guyana faces. Otherwise, you were in a place where you had Venezuela, second largest oil producer in the year 1914, and so on, and discoveries elsewhere. But now it's you. And so, much as I like Professor Sachs, I wouldn't say idealistic, but good thoughts in the direction of what we should do. The facts of practicality also demand that we try and find solutions, perhaps within the systems and through incremental change. I'd like to hear your views on that. So, so I share your views on incremental change. But before I address the question that you asked, I want to talk a bit about multilateralism. So we know that multilateralism is essential for developing countries. But if we examine all the multilateral systems, we have seen that in almost every instance, the interests of the developed world would prevail. So at the, we, we, what is happening <coughs> with the climate change framework and the justice arguments there have been repeated over and over again in other multilateral systems. We've seen the WTO evolve from special and differential treatment for small countries. And the developed world, Europe, United States, and everyone, they have pushed for full reciprocity today. Now, a country the size of St. Kitts and Nevis, I said this to President Obama, how do you expect a St. Kitts and Nevis to compete on the same footing as the United States of America. We're in a single building in New York. You have more people than the entire population of that country. This is a country that wants to work. Its trade will not harm global trade because it's below a de minimis level. Yet, we've been pressured into full reciprocity. We lost the preferential banana market, wiped out much of the well-being in the region. So that's, I don't want to prolong it. That's only on the multilateral system. We have seen an evolution in so-called transparency around financial sector reform. And that has led to the wiping out of the financial sector in the Caribbean, mm. the offshore financial institutions, because people say it's, it's black money flowing into these institutions. But we still have many jurisdictions in the developed world 
that are egregiously worse, that are allowed to survive in this system. And if you look at the UK financial system, I saw the recent outcry about banning oligarchs and seizing their monies for money from Russia. They knew all along Russian money was, was fueling the system. They were creating a safe haven for them. And until today, that happens. I can go through every single multilateral framework, and you would see what is happening now in the climate framework, where we have moved from common but differentiated responsibilities at the beginning they have effectively, in 20 years, eroded that concept to almost equal burden sharing today. Mm. And because the developed world refused to decarbonize early to allow the developing world, particularly China and, and India, the big ones, to peak at some time in 2030, maybe even beyond. But they took up more of the carbon budget and made an emergency situation. And today they are arguing everyone has to peak their emissions early, in spite of the reality on the ground where you have a massive energy deficit among many people who don't even have access. Because of that delay, and now it's almost equal burden sharing. I go, we have to do pledges to the, on the, we have to make equal pledges and on the, to decarbonize under the Paris Agreement, and then we are being monitored and penalize and soon penalize as small countries when our low emission is there. Mention the UK, and, and this is something I hope you can help with. Because you're from Columbia University. I've, I've spoken about this a couple of years ago. They have an environmental performance index. The United Kingdom is ranked number two in terms in the whole world. Guyana, 105. Now, my country, the forest alone, pristine rainforest, is bigger than England and Scotland combined. And I'm ranked 105, and the United Kingdom is ranked second. two, second in the world, when they cut down almost all of their primary forests historically. India, I saw the controversy with India, and they ranked the last 180. If you look at the map globally, you would see green countries and red countries. All the green countries which are good are in Europe and North America. And we're all the red countries in Africa and Asia, etc. They developed this index on the basis of 40 metrics. Now, at the beginning, you know if you're poor, you're, you're going to be lower down on the index. Because, because access to safe drinking water. I know which countries are the ones that don't have access to safe drinking water. It's countries in Africa, etc. It doesn't show effort. Any index of, but what these indices allow the world to do, and the developed world particularly, is to create the conditions for them to greenwash their efforts. And so we hear a lot of shouting. Uh, we had it at COP um, in, in Glasgow. Oh, let's end coal, but the UK now is reopening power plant. They were the ones championing to the end of coal. They're firing up their coal, coal plants now. Let's end deforestation, but no money into it. And, and so this we allow. The, there is a, a vast group of people complicit in allowing the developed world to get away with the justice argument. We have, if we want, to move, we have to return to the justice argument in the climate discussions. We can talk a lot about ambitions and a whole range of things, but we have to return to the justice arguments there. Now, coming to the oil and gas issue, the same thing we had. The Secretary General of the United Nations said, it's rogue countries who are trying to develop their oil and gas resources now. Um, we must ban all future investments in oil and gas. So IEA practically said the same thing. Now, if you do that, if you ban any future investments in oil and gas, you're preserving effectively a monopoly for the existing producers. Now, a country like mine that has just discovered oil and gas, where the per capita GDP is $9,000, 
In the United States, it's a $35,000. They've used up their carbon budget. If the world will continue to need fossil fuel, even in a net zero scenario, the justice argument dictates that we should be the ones producing it. And they have to decarbonize faster. So even with 10 FPSOs in Guyana, we're going to move, and, and that will be probably producing 2 million barrels of oil per day. By 2027, it's 1.2 million barrels. But with 10 FPSOs, we will still be a carbon negative country because of our forests, uh, which is a huge sink. So what they're hoping to achieve by 2050, Guyana has achieved, and even with the growth of the fossil fuel industry. We support early decarbonization. We support, I was part of the committee that the Secretary General put together to raise the $100 billion per, 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 per annum for adaptation funding. It never happened. But if we, if we need to move along this, this, this pathway, we have, uh, you know, there, there is no finan finan financing for it. So we, in Guyana's case, I, I think I'm talking too long. So it's, it's, it's a nuanced approach we are saying. These funds from the oil and gas industry would help us to do a, no, a range of things. Make our economy more resilient, adaptation purposes, fund the green energy transition. So we're not giving up our climate objectives. And we still support a carbon price. We support the removal of subsidy from fossil food, fuel production. So we support the vast, a quick move to, to ramp up the production of renewable energy, but the reality is that the demand now is not being met by new investments in renewable energy. So all the talk about peak oil and a whole range of stuff is just talk at this point in time until you can have adequate investments to introduce renewable energy at scale to, to cater for the growth in demand and to offset all demand funded by fossil fuel. Thank you. Your Excellency, thank you. That really deserves. And I am glad you brought in two subjects. Your Excellency, you are hearing what somebody else who is a new player in the game is saying. The, the needs are also there because there is so much unmet need. So, you know, to talk about completely removing, and we all know what happened in Glasgow and the wordings. And where did that wording come from? a declaration which was signed by two of the largest players, and Professor Sachs, I won't name them, but here everybody would know that those wordings came exactly from that particular place. And which were the countries which got targeted were us. You're absolutely right on that. But Your Excellency, let me take you on on the subject that you mentioned, the question of financing. I will then turn to the issue of multilateralism. We are looking at tremendous needs of financing. Someone here in one of these last sessions mentioned a figure of about two and a half to three trillion dollars required by the developing countries for various greening, let's put it very broadly, requirements in these countries. Let me say it's five or six trillion. Global savings rates is about 20 trillion dollars. It's not a macroeconomic problem. It's a problem of transferring resources. Now, I want to tell you, at the United Nations, most of the discussions keep going in the one-sided silo of grants and these kind of situations. I want to leave with you a thought, and please, I seek your reaction, because you served on the United Nations Secretary General's high-level task force on financing. I want to ask you, shouldn't we think of multilateral institutions which are able to do things at least, let me say, quasi-commercial, so that you are able to reduce the cost of capital going to developing countries and make it worth the while of investors and those with possibilities of investing in the developed world to invest in projects in the developing countries. Today, the sheer differential in the cost of capital tends to make many of these projects completely unviable. I'd be happy to have your views on that of Professor Sachs. Sure. Um, on, I don't think many of the multilateral financial institutions are fit for purpose. 
They can't intermediate climate funds and their orientation is not to produce, um, to, to deliver climate funds. I know that Mia Motley, when she spoke the last time, she made some proposals about the SDRs using that. And I think we need to seriously explore how we can leverage their balance sheets to provide greater funding, particularly for projects that have, green projects that have demonstrated high levels of return. And, and so we need to do that. But my experience with the GCF, with the World Bank, with the, even the Inter-American Development Bank, that they're bureaucratic, they do not have the appropriate instruments and the thinking within the institution to intermediate climate funds. And I'll give you some practical examples. When we got the money from Norway, I spoke of this morning, through the sale of forest carbon, we decided we want to establish some, some lessons for the world to prove that the money could be spent without it going for corruption, two, that you can monitor it, and indigenous people's um, affairs wouldn't be harmed, etc. So we agreed that a multilateral institution should intermediate the, mon the resources. We have had, this is money that we earn, they're custodians of. The, all they had to do was to ensure that it's transparently spent through audits, etc. We now have to apply, and they use their same loan processing and, and, and grant processing framework to process money that I have on deposit with them that should have been intermediate with me. me. We've had funds for solar panels. We have had a $5 million sitting there for almost 10 years, and it's not even moving forward. I, something fell down at my phone. I thought it was yours, um, the, the exasperation that you had. And I saw that because when President Clinton went to Haiti, he said something. Had I known that this is how the multilaterals work, when he had the experience after being president, then I, something would have been done. Because many of them, the, the policymakers, don't have the first-hand experience that we've had. You hear wonderful talk. You hear about all these reports being churned out by the World Bank and everything else about ambition and intermediation of funds. And then when you come to the practice, countries have to go through a nightmare. The same thing with the GCF. For $1 million readiness fund, they, you have to fill up documents that I will have a hard time navigating, even more <coughs> complex than if I'm working to raise $100 million in the private sector. With limited technical capability, I said to my staff, forget it. We, let's don't waste our time in Guyana. If we don't move on our own efforts, we never really address adaptation. Some countries don't have the choice. We have because we're earning from the forest tree sector. But a lot of the Caribbean countries, specific countries, they have to go through that process. When I was, uh, I was working on a committee to report to the heads of government, the Commonwealth heads of government, through the Commonwealth Secretariat, and we came up with a template to be used by all the multilaterals so that you don't have different procedures for every single agency. Once you've filled up one template, you can use it across agencies. They refuse to accept it, accept that because it means less work at the technical level, and they can't hold sort of damocles over your head. So a lot has to evolve there too. I, 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 I'm digressing, I, maybe, but I wanted to deal with that, have that said. We have to reform the entire, entire architecture for, for if we want to really scale up funding, green funding, we have to have a carbon price that would send a definitive signal. In the US, how would the private sector, how would the private sector make long-term investments if they know, don't know with the change of administration whether the climate policies would be the same? You need predictability, um, and particularly a carbon price affords that predictability if you're going to raise private money at scale to tackle this task. Absolutely. Your Excellency, absolutely right. But Professor Sachs, not a good commentary on multilateralism. Your comments, I'm afraid I've been handed a slip to say that it's curtains for us. 
the next round, but I'd really like Let to hear from you about multilateralism. I think it's a matter of uh, defining multilateralism. Mm -hmm. If you want to understand the World Bank and the IMF, simply understand that 15th and Pennsylvania in Washington is the U.S. Treasury. <laughs> 16th and Pennsylvania is the White House. Yes, 17th and Pennsylvania is the executive office of the president. 18th and Pennsylvania is the World Bank. <laughs> 19th and Pennsylvania <laughs> is the International Monetary right. Fund. Okay, this was set up for a reason. The World Bank is an anachronism the way it is run right now but it is run as an extension of U.S. foreign policy. It's stuck in part because it is a multilateral system that the U.S. won't give up its hold on. So each new capital round raises the dire question of what China's vote will be in the World Bank. So this is why this is boring. I've been at this for a long time. President Clinton may say, by the way, if he had only known, but I can tell you, I told him when he was president. So had he listened, it would be better. He wasn't a great listener. He was a wonderful talker. Uh, so I think that this is uh, a real issue of what is multilateralism. The closest we come is the UN Charter. Seriously. That was the best idea of the best president the United States ever had, Franklin Roosevelt. And we should make it work. It's not working very well right now. It's extraordinarily important. I give every day of my life to the UN at 3 in the morning, testifying to the UN Security Council this morning on the Nord Stream explosion. So I want the UN to work properly. The UN by itself doesn't bring the money, though. Do not wait for the US to bring the money. They won't. Also, Mr. Vice President, just a friendly, if I may, I would not let ExxonMobil into my house. You have, just watch your furniture, please. Uh, <laughs> you should be very careful. They're very good at grabbing. And that is a big problem. The world actually doesn't need your oil, I have to say. You need it for development because you haven't been given better alternatives. So I don't blame you. But the world certainly does not need that oil. We've got more than enough. It's going to be largely phased out. It's a sign of terrible misallocation of resources, priorities, lack of planning, and all the rest. Again, I don't blame you from your individual perspective, though I would say take care. I wrote the paper on the resource curse 30 years ago saying that countries have a bad problem. Like yours, they end up being fought over by powers that are bigger than a government. So you have to be extremely, extremely careful. But basically, the multilateralism we need is multilateralism that represents the whole world, not the North Atlantic. We have had 200 years of a North Atlantic system. It's ended. We need a true multilateral system. Professor Sachs, I want to thank you very much for that. I want to tell you all, in this session, since the morning, perhaps for the first time, many of you were laughing, smiling, nodding your heads. It was by design, but what was the idea that was sought to be put across? That we are about nation states and nation states collaborating. Professor Sachs is absolutely right. Nation states have to learn to collaborate for something which is in their own interest in the longer run. <coughs> but the way things are, is the way things are. And what His Excellency, the Vice President, has said, we need to work within the systems, nuance them, do what we want. But we need to work and act for Earth, because that is particularly important. I want to tell you, <coughs> Professor Sachs, Your Excellency, Mr. Vice President, I can only make the points to you 
about India, not only the fact of a small carbon footprint, but in terms of taking many decisions which many people would say, including in terms of what you said, Mr. Vice President, are they the right decisions? But the forward-looking ones, and with the Prime Minister himself wanting to lead this, the G20 is an opportunity, but it is a G20. Let's also understand that. But in this country, the amount of push and pressure, for example, on only solar power, the fact that it is today cheaper than perhaps any other form of energy couldn't have happened without this country stepping forward. So I want to tell you that here is a society which I take it is fairly committed to that. It follows from our, you know, one earth, one family, one community, one future kind of feelings that we have. But I want to thank you very much for this. And young lady, sorry that we took a little bit more of the time and ate a little bit into the lunch. Thank you very much, Terry, and thank you to everything. Uh, Mr. Nitin Desai, who was the person who started the entire ideas of sustainability, brought all of this. Sir, I hope that you see out here ideas that you, in a sense, incubated, still going on. We need to change, but we stand committed to change. Thank you very much for all of that. Thank you. What an engaging session, I must say. What an engaging session. Um, before we let you uh, off to the lunch, um, there's a very important announcement to make. Terry and uh, Guyana is signing an agricultural MOU. So I would uh, really request Dr. Uh, Vibhadavan, DG Terry, and um, DG uh, Guyana, Mr. Mandal Mandlara Ram Ramraj, to kindly come up on the stage and sign the MOU. Minister, can we have you on the stage, please? Every talk is simply as possible, convert it into financial resources, save the money. Yes, one, uh, it's better actually saying thank you. Uh, right? Actually saying the Minister of Finance is here. Can we have a loud round of applause, please? The MOU is being signed by Mr. Ashnish Singh, Minister of Finance, Guyana, and Terry by DG Terry, Ms. Dr. Vibhadavan. Lunch is being served at the Margosa's lawn. Kindly please proceed there. <laughs> 